Hello, class. This is a discussion on PhysioX exercise three. I asked you to do activities three, four, and five, as well as seven, eight, and nine. Let's begin our discussion talking about activity three within exercise three. Activity three was learning about threshold. Threshold is defined as the minimum amount of voltage needed in order to start an action potential. In order to start an action potential, voltage-gated channels must be opened. And voltage-gated channels first begin on a neuron at a place called the axon hillock. Sometimes this is called, quote unquote, the trigger zone. An action potential is a temporary reversal of membrane potential. It is a way for neurons to send very quick signals to downstream target cells or even organs. What is a typical threshold stimulus in millivolts needed in order to open the first set of volt voltage-gated channels at the axon hillock? Depending on the type of neuron you are studying, this is usually minimally 15 millivolts, but we will see in our activity that our threshold is closer to around 20 millivolts. The number itself is not important. Rather, knowing the term threshold and what that means is more important. It's the minimum amount of stimulus required to open voltage-gated channels found at the axon hillock. And in lecture, you learn that the first voltage-gated channel to open is sodium voltage-gated channels, followed by potassium voltage-gated channels. And then down at the axon terminal, we find a third type of voltage-gated channel called calcium voltage-gated channels. Let's look at the apparatus that we are using in this activity. You can see in the picture on the right-hand side that we are playing with an axon that has been disconnected from the cell body and the dendrites, which are found as extensions from the cell body, also known as the soma. And it's also disconnected from the axon terminal. We have a stimulating electrode shown here as S. And then we have two recording electrodes known as R1 and R2. And what we're going to see is, once we find the threshold voltage, do we see an action potential at recording electrode one and also at recording electrode two? Because an action potential is an all or none. And once it's initiated at one point in the axon, it should continue further down the axon. So let's look at our data. We started out with a stimulus voltage of 10 millivolts. We can see at recording electrode one and recording electrode two, there was no change in electrical current. We did not detect any microvolts. So no action potential was detected. Then we up upgraded our stimulus voltage to 20. And we noticed that yes, we did get an electrical signal of 100 microvolts at recording electrode one, as well as recording electrode two. This was an action potential. It was propagated along the axon. Action potentials are all or none. Once we hit our minimum stimulus voltage going higher than that to 30, 40, or even 50 millivolts, we still got the same peak values recorded at recording electrode one and two. This, of course, this experiment nicely shows the same experiments you're learning about in lecture done by Hodgkin and Huxley using the giant squid axon. Once that threshold was reached, giving a greater stimulus did not lead to a greater amount of electrical current detected during the action potential. It's all or none.
Now let's move on to activity four. In this activity, we were looking at voltage-gated sodium channels. <clears throat> Again, we were playing with an axon disconnected from the soma and the axon terminal. We had a stimulating electrode shown here in your picture as S, and two recording electrodes, recording electrode one and recording electrode two. When we set up our experiment, we told the machine to give stimuli every two seconds. And a stimulus was given every two seconds up to 10 seconds. And we see that in our data, data, chain, uh, data table. We see data at two seconds, four, six, eight, and 10 seconds. We were also playing with sodium voltage-gated channel inhibitors. One is called tetrodotoxin or TTX. This is generated by the pufferfish liver. It actually is a toxin from what the pufferfish eat. They themselves don't necessarily make that toxin. It actually comes from the food that the pufferfish eat. And in lecture, you learn more about this toxin as well as saxitoxin and lidocaine. In fact, fun fact, uh, fun fact, they are now starting to grow pufferfish in, in uh, enclosed chambers and regulating what they eat so that they no longer make this tetrodotoxin as a byproduct in their liver or store it in their liver. It actually is made by the shellfish that they eat. So um, now uh, chefs uh, don't have to worry about preparing the puffer fish and potentially nicking the liver, which is where this toxin is stored by the puffer fish. Lidocaine is also a sodium voltage gated channel blocker, but it is not as strong, not as lethal. It's reversible. That's why your dentist uses it to numb your mouth before fixing your cavities. So we are going to apply either tetrodotoxin or lidocaine in between recording electrode one and recording electrode two. When we apply the toxin or the drug, we should see that the action potentials downstream, downstream, the action potentials recorded by recording electrode number two should no longer exist. They should not happen. So first we did our control. Notice that we used a, our minimum stimulus voltage of 30 millivolts from our past experiment. We know 20 millivolts is needed. So this is even a higher stimulus. We know we're going to reach threshold. We keep that consistent. And we, we run our control. We test electrode number one, check, and electrode number two. The stimulus is sent every two seconds and both recording electrodes every two, four, six, eight, ten 10 seconds later, they are recording and spiking in action potential. Then we add tetrodotoxin. Again, this is added in between recording electrode one and two. So notice that recording electrode one still generates an action potential every two seconds once the stimulus is given. But recording electrode number two no longer spikes an action potential after four seconds. The toxin has taken effect. Blocking sodium voltage gated channels means an action potential cannot happen. We repeat the same experiment, putting lidocaine in between recording electrode one and two. And again, because recording electrode one is not compromised, it spikes an action potential every two seconds. However, recording electrode number two ceases to generate an action potential after six seconds. Why is it after six seconds versus tetrodotoxin, which blocked an action potential after four seconds? Tetrodotoxin is much more lethal. It is much more competitive. It is considered to be irreversible under normal biological conditions. 
And so it grabs hold of those sodium voltage gated channels much more quickly, we say with higher affinity. Lidocaine, less so. And this is again, the reason why your dentist uses lidocaine on you to numb your nerves before doing a, your, the surgery on your mouth versus tetrodotoxin. In your homework packet, you are asked questions about tetrodotoxin, saxitoxin, and lidocaine. And there's a question in your homework packet that says, fugu lovers beware. Fugu refers to the puffer fish meal. Um, it is considered a delicacy. And again, it needs to be prepared with utmost care by a very knowledgeable chef, careful not to nick the liver, which is where this toxin is stored. And again, puffer fish are starting to be raised in caged areas where they're, the, they're, what they eat and graze on is no longer um, considered to be uh, poisonous. So it's not poisonous to the puffer fish, but it's poisonous to the person. Activity five. This is where we were now trying to assess absolute versus relative refractory period. These are two terms that are discussed in great detail in your lecture material. Absolute refractory period strictly defined means no amount of stimulus, no matter how great, can generate an action potential again. That means that threshold and reaching threshold, the threshold bar is set infinitely high. No amount of stimulus can reach it. This ensures that action potentials do not build on each other. And notice in this picture that an action potential, be, um, absolute refractory period begins with reaching threshold here, roughly at minus 55 millivolts. Sodium voltage gated channels are activated and then they become inactivated and potassium voltage gated channels help repolarize. Roughly when the um, membrane potential returns back to roughly minus 55 again, the neuron exits absolute refractory period and enters relative refractory, relative refractory period. This relative refractory period means enough sodium voltage gated channels have moved from the inactive state into a state where they could open again. Uh, this means they have become deactivated. And when they're deactivated, they could, if the stimulus is great enough, be activated again. But sometimes the stimulus has to be greater than what it was before. For example, if you look at this number value over here, going from minus 70 to minus 55 is a difference of 15 millivolts. But let's say the cell is hyperpolarized and it's way down here, say at minus 80. Well, to go from minus 80 up to minus 55 would now require a stimulus of 25 millivolts. So now what we did was we had again a stimulating electrode and we had just one recording electrode. And the idea was we were going to stimulate the neuron and every so often stimulate the neuron again. And the question was, when we stimulated it a second or third time, did we see another action potential? If not, was that because the neuron was an absolute refractory period and threshold was infinitely high? Or was it in a hyperpolarized state? Is, was it in relative refractory period? And we just simply need to give a bigger stimulus. So our first run, we stimulated the neuron every 250 milliseconds. Now, given that an action potential in most neurons lasts about one to two milliseconds, clearly a stimulus every 250 at our sub-threshold of 20 millivolts, and we learned that from activity three, 
should give us a second action potential, and it did. So then we cut the time in half. What if we give a stimulus every 125 milliseconds using our minimum voltage of 20? And the answer was yes. We did detect a second action potential at recording the electrode one. But then we cut the time in half roughly again, and we kept our minimum voltage of 20. And this led to no second action potential at recording electrode number one. It spiked an action potential initially, but when the second stimulus came, that, that recording electrode was not able to detect a second action potential, which begged the question, was the neuron an absolute refractory period or relative? If relative, then we just need to increase the voltage. So we increased the voltage to 25. Was that voltage enough to detect a second action potential? And the answer was no. Still begs the question, was the neuron an absolute refractory period where threshold was infinitely high or, excuse me, my phone, or do we just need to increase the amount of stimulus? So now we bumped our stimulus up to 30. And it turned out that yes, now we were able to detect a second action potential arriving in recording electrode number one. So that told us that the neuron was in relative refractory period and we simply needed to give it a bigger stimulus. Maybe it was pretty hyperpolarized and we needed a bigger stimulus to reach that threshold value. So now we cut the time again. Um, so now we're at 30 seconds and we kept our stimulus voltage at 30. And look what happened. We lost that second action potential. And we said, well, we're very smart now. We know that we should probably increase the stimulus voltage. Notice that still wasn't enough. We increased the voltage to 40 millivolts. It still wasn't enough. Wow, it's starting to look like maybe the neuron is an absolute refractory period. But wait, we increased it to 45 millivolts. And now, yes, we were able to get a second action potential. Being gluttons for punishment, we just decreased the time in half again to 15 milliseconds. And we knew, well, we probably need to increase the voltage. Let's just cut to the chase. So we increased it to 60 millivolts. And it turns out that was enough to get a second action potential. We cut the time down in half again to 7.5 milliseconds. We kept our voltage of 60. It still was enough to get an action potential. Then we cut the time in half again, keeping our voltage at 60, and we lost the second action potential. Now, you should be very angry right now because we, we were not allowed to continue on in this activity. PhysioX said, okay, you're done. But do we really know at this point was the neuron in absolute refractory period or in relative? You heard me say that a typical action potential lasts one to two milliseconds. So ideally, PhysioX should have allowed us to keep that 3.75 milliseconds in between stimuli, but allow us to increase the voltage, say, up to 80 or 100 to see if we were able to generate a second action potential. But we weren't allowed to do that experiment. We will never know at the end of this activity if the neuron was in absolute or relative refractory period. We weren't allowed to continue to increase the stimulus voltage. Now, I think you should be very angry over that. I know how love you. I, I know how much you love doing your physio axes. I know you wanted this to continue. <laughs>
Okay, moving on to activity seven. Activity seven was showing you conduction velocity. In your lecture material, you are going to learn about the importance of myelination of an axon. Myelination allows for saltatory conduction. And this means that the action potential is able to jump, shown here, from one node. A node is basically an opening in between the myelination to another. This allows for much more rapid, um, uh, uh, more rapid transmission of the action potential. And make sure you listen to that, more rapid transmission along the axon of the action potential. It does not mean that the magnitude of the action potential increases. Remember, action potentials are all or none. Not only does myelination increase the conduction velocity, but it also saves the neuron energy, ATP, with respect to the sodium potassium ATPase that has to reset the membrane potential. In this activity, we are going to play with different axons that are either heavily myelinated, lightly myelinated, or not myelinated at all, but also we are going to explore the idea of size, the axon diameter. The larger the diameter, the less resistance there is to the actual flow of the ions going down the axon. You can think of this as a multiple lane highway allowing for more traffic to go with less resistance than when a multiple lane highway gets reduced down to a single lane and everyone has to funnel into one lane. So the larger the axon diameter, the less resistance to the ion flow as the action potential is occurring. In this activity, we were exploring three different types of neurons. The A fiber was a large diameter and myelinated axon. Our B neuron was a medium diameter and it was myelinated. And our C fiber was a very thin diameter, small diameter, and it was not myelinated. When we look at our data, we were looking at our heavy myelination, light myelination, and none. But also remember the diameter changes and the C fiber was the smallest diameter. You were asked to do some math calculations in order to uh, calculate velocity. Velocity is change in distance over time, which is why you divided the distance between recording electrode one and two by the time once you converted it to seconds. I will not be asking you to do this on your lab exam. I simply want you to know which axons allowed for the fastest conduction velocity or transmission of the action potential. And notice the axon that was the biggest diameter and most heavily myelinated had the fastest conduction velocity. Another cautionary tale, again, do not confuse a higher conduction velocity with more magnitude of an action potential. An action potential is all or nothing. Once it spikes, it's the same amount of voltage that is generated over and over and over again. Hodgkin and Huxley experiments showed us that. Conduction velocity is how rapidly the action potential is sent down the axon towards the axon terminal. Two more activities to go and then we are finished. Activity eight. Activity eight was looking at the axonal terminus or terminal bouton is what I call it in my lectures. This is where the action potential shown here is the nerve impulse reaches the terminal bouton. And at the terminal bouton, not only do we have sodium voltage gated channels and potassium voltage gated channels, but now a third variety, calcium voltage gated channels.
And when calcium voltage gated channels open, calcium flows into the axon terminal. The presence of, of calcium in the axonal terminal causes synaptic vesicles, shown here as these little bubbles, filled with neurotransmitter to fuse with the membrane and exocytose. And you can see the neurotransmitter being exocytosed into the synaptic cleft. In activity eight, we were looking at first control, a control sample with a known amount of calcium. And we were looking at how much, how much, how many, I should say, synaptic vesicles fused and exocytosed when there was a low frequency of action potentials. Maybe they were being fired like this every two seconds versus high frequency over and over and over and over again. And the idea was with the control that the more action potentials arriving at the terminal bouton, the more calcium entered the terminal bouton and the more synaptic vesicles fused and exocytosed. We also looked at what happened with how many synaptic vesicles were exocytosed with no calcium versus low calcium. The low calcium sample had a lower amount than the control calcium sample. And then we were looking at another divalent cation, magnesium. And the question there was, could magnesium be a suitable substitute for calcium? And our results were the following. With the control calcium and low in intensity stimuli, say every two seconds, few synaptic vesicles fused and exocytosed. When action potentials were more rapid, high intensity, this led to more calcium entering the cytoplasm of the terminal bouton, more synaptic vesicles fusing and exocytosing, and that meant more neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. With no calcium, there was no neurotransmitter release, regardless of the intensity. Then we looked at the low calcium, and remember the low calcium sample was lower than the control. Low calcium with low intensity action potentials led to eh, a vesicle released. High intensity led to more vesicles released but not as much as the control calcium sample. When we got to magnesium, another cation, a, cat, a divalent cation, just like calcium, it worked, but it was not a great substitute. In fact, it, the magnesium concentration we were using was supposed to mimic the same concentration as the control. So we did get some calcium, or sorry, some synaptic vesicles released similar to the low calcium, but in short, it was not the best substitute. In fact, we oftentimes give magnesium to patients who have seizure activity because the magnesium does not work as well in those calcium voltage gated channels. It kind of gums them up and kind of blocks them and it reduces the amount of synaptic vesicles released. And this helps quiet or reduce neuronal activity in those patients having seizures. We're now at our last activity. Activity nine is where we're putting everything together. And what do I mean by that? We were really exploring a continuum of neurons, a reflex arc. It, began, it begins with sensory neurons that are detecting some sort of stimulus shown here as pain from a candle. And that action potential is sent to an interneuron. Interneurons are neurons that are found in your brain and spinal cord fully contained. And then interneurons will signal motor neurons. Clearly you should not keep your finger over that flame. You should withdraw your hand. So this is, these are parts 
or components of a reflex arc. In lecture material, you uh, learn about a depolarizing synaptic potential. Depolarizing synaptic potential means the downstream neuron has received an EPSP or excitatory postsynaptic potential. That means it got less negative, closer to threshold, more likely to spike an action potential. This is different from a hyperpolarizing synaptic potential or an IPSP. An IPSP means the downstream neuron becomes hyperpolarized, more negative, further away from thresh threshold, less likely to spike an action potential. Let's look at our apparatus and then in our last slide, we'll go over our data. Out of this reflex arc, we're looking at only a sensory neuron. In particular, we were going to look at a Piscinian corpuscle shown here in purple. I'm circling it with my green pen. It's lamellated. Sometimes there, it's called a uh, lamellated uh, corpuscles, but Piscinian corpuscle. It is a receptor a, a, that detects a lot of deep pressure. And notice that it's connected to a downstream neuron here. So we have a two neuron chain. We have two neurons out of our three neurons that I just discussed. And what we're going to see is what will happen when we stimulate the Piscinian corpuscle, the sensory neuron, with a weak subthreshold stimulus versus a moderate stimulus versus a strong. Now you need to keep in mind that S again stands for stimulating electrode. And you also need to realize that we are exploring four recording electrodes. Look at the placement of these four electrodes. Oops, let me erase my ink. Recording electrode one is in the soma of the sensory neuron it will detect graded potentials. Recording electrode number two is in the axon of the sensory neuron. It will detect an action potential in that sensory neuron. Recording electrode three is in the soma or cell body of the interneuron. It will detect a graded potential. And recording electrode four is in the axon of the interneuron it will detect an action potential. In sum, recording electrode one and three are in the cell bodies and they will detect local graded potentials. Recording electrode two and four are found in the axons. They are going to detect action potentials. Again, recording electrode one and two are in the sensory neuron and recording electrode three and four are in the interneuron. First of all, we got our baseline read for both neurons. We have the sensory neuron and we have the interneuron. Highlighted in blue, I'll remind you, recording electrode one and three are in the somas of these neurons and will detect graded potentials. Recording electrode two and four are in the axons and they are going to detect action potentials. So we first have no stimulus and obviously neither of these neurons are going to have any change in their resting membrane potential. And because there's no change in the resting membrane potential, no action potential was detected. Then we gave a weak stimulus. And this weak stimulus was able to move the cell body of the sensory neuron from minus 70 to minus 60. That's a change of 10 millivolts. We know from our activity number three of this exercise 
that a 10 millivolt change is not enough to reach threshold. Clearly no action potential was generated. Clearly no vesicles would be released. And that means the downstream interneuron stayed at resting membrane potential. Then we gave a moderate stimulus. We went from minus 70 to minus 40. That's a change of 30 millivolts. We know from our third activity that that is certainly enough to reach threshold. Notice the downstream recording electrode two detected action potentials and generated over 16 of them. This led to quite a few vesicles being released. Out goes the neurotransmitter. And notice that the downstream interneuron went from minus 70 to minus 50, a change of 20 millivolts. We know from activity three that a 20 millivolt change is enough to generate an action potential. And sure enough, the downstream recording electrode number four in the axon detected and generated um, this change, sorry, detected the change in millivolts and generated multiple action potentials. Then lastly, we went on and we explored what happens when we go from minus 70 to minus 25, a very strong stimulus. Notice that more action potentials were generated in recording electrode two found in the axon of the sensory neuron. Even more vesicles were released because more calcium entered the terminal bouton. We learned that from activity eight. This generated to an even greater change in membrane potential in the downstream interneuron from minus 70 to minus 40. And that also led to more action potentials recorded at recording electrode four. This physio -X, even though it took quite a bit of time, uh, actually, if I assigned all nine activities, it would have taken you close to five hours to complete this. Obviously, there's a reason why I did not assign all nine activities, but the activities I did assign pair very nicely with your lecture material, which is why I urged you to watch the lectures on membrane potentials and action potentials before you did this PhysioX. Thank you, and I'll see you in class.